You are about to be locked inside the Stingray Show. And coming up on this edition, we are going to be taking a look at week number one for all 16 teams in the SEC as Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered will join us to give us his take on all of the huge matchups this weekend, including Miami and Florida, as well as Clemson versus Georgia, Texas A&M versus Notre Dame, and then, of course, on Sunday, USC versus LSU. That's all ahead on this edition of the Stingray Show. Guys, we've got a lot to cover, so let's get the Stingray Show rocking and rolling. Hi, this is Tim Brando with a reminder. Those of you on Tide 100.9, Look out, you're about to feel the buzz of Stingray. This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, Mark, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you feel that responsibility to pay it forward and give some kid a chance coming up in the ranks, kind of like Tony did for you? Why you think I'm talking to Stingray tonight? <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. No, I mean, it's look. No. Hey, Stingray, here's the deal. When you get involved with Texas, it's like getting married to a stripper. (laughs) And and let me explain this. It looks good. It's kind of sexy on on the surface. Yeah. But then you get the baggage. You get the drama. You get all that eventually comes with it. And that's what you get with Texas, and that's what the Big 12 learned. And Heath, any thoughts on our show moving forward? Hey, to everyone in Tuscaloosa listening here on Tide 100.9, with the Stingray Show, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it, because it's the best show going today, baby. Woo! Woo! Welcome back inside the Stingray Show. Hope all is well with you. And now we are about to do a deep dive into week number one. And in order to do that, we are going to bring on a familiar voice to the Stingray Show. As I was going to say, a familiar face, but obviously you can't see our faces. So anyway, a familiar voice and that is of Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered to do a deep dive into college football. Chris, how are you doing? Stingray Heath, I'm doing well. Appreciate you guys having me, man. Just fired up for week one, and as the great Heath Hopkins once said, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it. That's how I feel about the 2024 (laughs) season. At least someone listens to me. No one else here does, but at least someone does. Listen, I've, I've, admittedly, I've heard many things and forgotten them, but that is one thing I'll never forget, Heath. If you don't like it, you better learn to love it. That is just <laughs> hit the nail on the head, my friend. Well, um, you know, I had to get in the face of a six-year-old football player on my five and six-year-old football team because he thought he was in charge. I was like, um, let's get it straight right now. I'm in charge, and if you don't like it, I promise you will learn to love it. You understand me? <laughs> so maybe a different meaning for him. Maybe a little bit, yeah. But positive connotation for me, I promise. So, Chris, before we get to week one, go ahead and give us your thoughts on week zero, and especially Georgia Tech upsetting a ranked Florida State team across the pond in Dublin, Ireland. Yeah, Stingray, the weekend of the underdogs, right? When you look at week zero, I think all of the betting underdogs hit or covered their lines. Um, you know, I admittedly, I was one of those. I was on Florida State. I, I really thought Florida State, their physicality on both lines of scrimmage, I thought they'd be able to kind of lean on Georgia Tech and wear them down and use the running game. And, you know, I know Brent Key is doing some great things in Atlanta, but I just felt like FSU probably had a little bit too much. And, I, like many, were very, very wrong. And, I mean, give give the Jackets a ton of credit, man. I, you know, after that first drive where Florida State was on script and were able to move the football the way they wanted to and, uh, you know, again, really bully them up front, the way Georgia Tech responded, right, doing it on their own, being able to run the football, Haynes King, who I think is a bit of a, a magician back there in the pocket, the way he's able to kind of navigate, maneuver, and made some big throws and, you know, and then there's the curious case of DJ Uyunglele, right? Which I just – DJ is who he is. I mean, he's just – he is who he is. He, he's, he doesn't look like he's progressed at all since his days yeah. at Clemson. Uh, looks like he struggles to me to read the defenses. He's confused most of the time. 
you know, late in the game when you saw obviously Georgia Tech's going man to man, he's able to when he knows where he's supposed to throw it, he can make a throw. But you know, any time outside of that, DJ really struggled. So you know, it, it was the upset. I think the college football world was kind of hoping for. It was kind of it was irony after the way the offseason went and Florida State fans giving anybody who would listen to hell about why they should have been in the playoff and how they're going to be on the revenge tour this year. And that got put to bed really, really quickly. So, uh, again, I think you give all the credit in the world to Georgia Tech and the identity that Brent Key has built in Atlanta. Um, really, really disappointing for FSU. And you kind of wonder, guys, where they go from here. And, yeah. you know, if DJU continues to struggle, are you just going to ride it out with him? Or is there somebody else coming off the bench that maybe could be the answer, right? And also, too, we heard about this this Florida State defensive line, or they're the best in college football. Something ain't adding up, because that sure as, sure as heck ain't what I saw in that week zero game. As for the rest of the games, man, I mean, it's hard to draw conclusions from these games, but SMU surviving against Nevada, yeah. it was a rough day for the ACC. I mean, SMU was a team that, People have been picking as a dark horse in the ACC to compete. I mean, you could have argued they should have lost that game. Uh, and then we had some, again, guys, really entertaining games with the New Mexico and Montana State game. <laughs> and i got to be honest with you. I popped a couple NyQuil and passed out. I didn't see the Hawaii game, but I did see they didn't cover. But, uh, yeah, I, I was unable to stay up and watch the boys on the island. Shame on me. But week zero, it was a week zero that really lived up to the hype. And, I think it's only guys setting the tone for what's probably going to be a wacky college football season. And, Chris, let me also say this. The FCS already upset an FBS program, and in doing so, they had a 17-point comeback in the fourth quarter to do it. Yeah, it was impressive. I, I, Montana State, though, was a favorite in that game. So, yeah. you know, I, I – Early on, New Mexico, a couple big turnovers they were able to generate, and, and I think they had a scoop and score in that game, if I remember correctly. But, uh, it, no, again, listen, when you looked at the Week Zero slate, when you think about how entertaining it was, it, it couldn't have gone much better. I mean, even even McNeese and Tarleton State came down to like a last-second field goal. So, again, guys, I think it's just really setting us up for what we're going to continue to see, which is there's tons of parity in college football, the the, the – you know, we complain a lot about conference realignment, portal, NIL, but the product on the field, it's never been better. It's never been more entertaining. It's never been more fun to watch. Saturdays are still Saturdays, and I think we got a glimpse of that. You know, I've covered a game at McNeese State. I know about the Cowboys. Tarleton State, I had never heard of that school before Saturday, and I've heard, I thought, almost of every school. Can anyone tell me the mascot of Tarleton State? No. Not without Googling it. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, Chris, my question for you is this. I had about a dozen people, probably more than a dozen people, tell me that Florida State was going to lose that opener, that Georgia Tech was going to beat them, beat them outright. Those same people have been telling me before this weekend and after this weekend that Florida State is going to lose again this upcoming weekend. Some said it before the season even started. Because I'm not going to be shocked if Florida State goes 0 2 to start the season. I'm like, really? And so I haven't done a lick of study, and I have not researched it, and I won't. But your thoughts about Florida State and Boston College this weekend? I, you know, I'd be surprised if after getting punched in the face by Georgia Tech, FSU came home because that game is in Tallahassee. Uh, I'd be surprised if they came home and lost again. Now I think Boston College is tricky for sure. Um, I would be really stunned, though, at Florida State after that, the way they got humbled in Ireland, came to the homeland, played on the home field, and lost. So I don't know that I'd go that far. But, yeah, I mean, it's a slippery slope, man. You know this, Heath, as well as anybody, that momentum in college football and college sports, positive or negative, it's a fickle mistress, right? And it can, it can really – things can really snowball. So, you know, I'm just most curious to see, like, if there's early struggles by DJU, where does FSU go from there? Because, again, at some point, like, how long can you – and it's crazy. Like, we're talking about this after only one game, but it's – you know, it's only a 12-game season. And, I mean, I'm sure Florida State's looking at this as like, hey, we're still in the college football playoff race. We're still in the playoff hunt. One loss doesn't wreck your season, but your margin for error is virtually non-existent now. So, yeah. I think I think FSU will win, but I'm more – I'm more interested in just how does DJU look in the process. Hmm. So, Chris, let's go on ahead and start 
with something that you are familiar with, obviously, that is the SEC. Let's start this major weekend with the game that is there in Atlanta between Clemson and Georgia. Give us your breakdown of the Dogs and the Tigers. Yes, Stingray. It kind of feels like this game's flying under the radar a little bit of the big four we have in the SEC because I, I think I think most are having a hard time seeing this one being really close. And I actually fall in that category. I've got Georgia covering on the 13 and a half number. Uh, It's one of my best bets of the week that I've locked in. Could I see Clemson making this thing interesting early? I think they've got the bodies in the trenches on the defensive front to do so. We also don't know what Georgia is going to look like at running back, right? Kirby Smart wouldn't comment on whether Trevor Trevor Etienne is going to be suspended for week one or not. Uh, I believe it's Roderick Robinson is having a toe surgery for turf toe. So, I mean, they're down a true freshman at running back. Cash Jones is probably going to have to play as well. They're down significantly at the running back position. So could things get interesting from that standpoint? Sure. But guys, outside of that, like what position group is Clemson better than Georgia at? And I just don't think there is one. Like I, I think Georgia top to bottom across the board is the better football team. Kirby Smart is a master motivator. Um, he's the best coach in college football for my money, and I think Georgia's loaded across the board. I think I think they're pissed off from last year. I think they want to make a point. I know at media days, Kirby said, we're not motivated by successes or failures, all, whatever, on field, off field, whatever. He can say that all he wants, but I think Georgia's going to come out with an extra edge, extra chip on the shoulder. I mean, it's a big game, too, for Dabo in the ACC, right? It's, it's a huge game for the perception of the Clemson Tigers program, and it's a huge game from the standpoint, guys, We've seen Georgia go out there and break the will of their opponents before. So if you're Clemson, just don't get embarrassed, lose respectably. Uh, Don't let that Georgia game beat you multiple times because it certainly can. They can break their spirit uh, if you're not careful. So I got Georgia winning. I got Georgia winning big in this one. Hmm. So Chris and Heath, hold that thought because we are up against our final break. And when we come back, we're going to dive into Notre Dame, Texas A&M, Florida, Miami, and of course, USC, LSU. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Ferguson of South's Finest Meats, the official sponsor of the Stingray Show, has a message for you. Everything we do here is fresh and custom made, custom to order. You know, I tell people when they come in, you know, if you don't see what you like, ask somebody. You know, we've got the capability to process it, make it. You know, if you want a different blend of hamburger meat, we'll do your brisket blend. We'll do your chuck blend. We'll do your sirloin blend. You know, we do all that right here. We are a butcher shop. That's what we do. So, Please don't be afraid to ask if you don't see what you like. We can make you any size patty you want. We can make you any amounts you want. You know, people come and say, well, how many patties come in the box? Well, ma'am, how many would you like in a box? You know, you want 12, we'll put 12. You want 25, we'll put 25. That's just one of the many things that South's Finest Meats has to offer the official butcher shop of the Stingray Show. Welcome back. Instead of our final segment right here on the Stingray Show, our guest this evening is our familiar friend and familiar voice, Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered. And Chris, I do want to go to another game, and it's actually the game that you were taking SEC Unfiltered on the road to. It is going to be in Gainesville between the Florida Gators and the Miami Hurricanes. Both coaches desperately need a win to start the season. If you would, Chris, go on ahead and give us your take on the Hurricanes and the Gators. Yeah, Stingray Heath, first thing, cannot wait to get down to Gainesville, experience a game of the Swamp, something I've never done before in my entire life. So I don't think I could have picked a much better one. And this is this is what makes college football great, right? I mean, it's a pair of fan bases. It's the first game of the year, but a pair of fan bases both coming in. Both view this as a must-win game. Both feel like they should win the game. And both are going to have full-on meltdowns if and when their team loses, right? So, I mean, it is it is like all stakes. You know, all the, the stakes are high just in week one. 
Um, you know, guys, I, I went back and forth on this one a little bit. I think Miami's a very talented roster. I had Miami my college ball playoff. Like, I think they've got that kind of roster with what they've assembled. Um, but, you know, with Cam Ward and company, I think going into the swamp week one, I think Florida's a very talented football team. I think we're a little down on Florida, obviously, because schedule is really difficult. But I think this is a really talented roster. Love Graham Mertz at the quarterback position. I think Trey Wilson on the outside. Elijah Badger's a name to watch at wide receiver, the Arizona State transfer. And then defensively, I think they're going to be much better this year. And I think a hungry, desperate crowd is going to yeah. will Florida to a 23-20 to 20 win. I've got the Gators. And, again, I can't wait to experience that environment. And, Chris, before we get to Heath, I do want to also mention this. I believe it was game one. For Billy Napier, nobody gave Florida a shot to beat Utah, and they knocked them off in the swamp a couple years ago. This game kind of feels like that just a little bit. It does. They've, they've defied the odds before, so they'll be trying to do it yeah. again. Wow. You know, Chris, looking at uh, this entire season, not just week one, you know, I'm going to ask you a question about my Bulldogs of Mississippi State real quick. Now, last year, Mississippi State had like a non-coach as head coach, and they won five games. They finally broke the bowl streak. I think it was, what, 13, 14 years in a row they had been to a bowl game uh, consecutive years. And so a lot of the media nationally is putting them at four, four and a half wins on the season. And I was like, wow, they won five with a non-coach last year. And so now you're coming into the season now, and, and like everyone's like, oh, yeah, well, we're going to drop you down another win. That's always best for a first-year head coach who will have no expectations. But is there something out there that people are missing, or are they right? Is Mississippi State, are they par for four games, going, you know, winning their four non-conference games and going 0-8 in the conference? I just don't see that happening. I, I hate to say it, Heath, but that's exactly where I've got Mississippi State going in the year, 4-8, and 0-8. Um, can they do more? Absolutely. Like, I, I love Blake Shapin, Kelly Akari, that connection. I think the Jeff Levy offense is going to be really exciting. I just worry about them defensively. Like, I don't know how they're going to mm -hmm. stop. I don't know how they're going to stop anybody, Heath. And it's and it's it's so much new in Starkville. I mean, zero returning starters on offense, two on defense. So, you know, I, I think the Florida game is winnable. I think the Arkansas game is winnable. I think more than likely you split those. Um, and I just don't know outside of that, honestly, he, so I mean, I, I, you know, I think getting to a bowl game would be a massive victory for Jeff yeah. Levy in year one. You got to beat Arizona state too, man. You got to go to Tempe and win that game. I, don't, I know they're not very good, but you still got to go out there and win that game on the West coast. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, I hate to say it, Heath, but I'm, I'm kind of right there in that four and eight, oh, and eight. It's weird to think about state at oh, and eight in conference play, but. I think two conference wins is probably your best case scenario. Stephen, hang on. I'm doing some notes here. Like Chris Phillips off the Christmas card list. Okay, let me mark him off. There we go. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right. So, Chris, let's go to Sunday evening. USC, LSU in Vegas. Give us your breakdown of the Tigers versus the Trojans. Stingray points. Expect lots and lots of points. Yeah. I think a lot of scoring in this one. Um, and, and I say that, by the way, do I think both defenses can and probably will take a step forward this year? Yeah. Yes. Especially for LSU. Like, I think they're going to be better under Blake Baker. I think the ironic part, Stingray, so I'll go ahead and give you this. I've got LSU winning this football game. 38-35 is my final. The ironic part of this, I think LSU gets a late – defensive stop to secure the win. And I think if the biggest difference in LSU's defense from last year to this year, if the only difference is they're able to get two or three stops when they need them, yeah. when that, that they couldn't get last year, they've improved on defense, right? And yeah. I think that's all LSU fans really want. You just don't want to repeat an old Miss last year where it's like, we can't get one stop, not even yeah. one, right? So, you know, this is another one where it's a huge game for the head coaches. I mean, if if Lincoln Riley loses, I think it's going to be a bigger deal nationally. If Brian Kelly loses, I think it's going to be a bigger deal locally, right? Like the folks in the boot are going to be about ready to give him the darn boot, if you know what I mean. So uh, 
I expect offense again. I, I think the defenses will be better, but I don't think in the course of an offseason you can make that big of a jump. I love the over 63 and a half. And again, I, I like LSU to get the win. Uh, they've got to, man. Haven't won a season opener since 2019. I do think that'll change. And big day from Garrett Nussmeyer, Kyra Lacey, the running game with Caleb Jackson, that great offensive line, 38-35, Tigers. Chris, to follow that up, I read a shocking article, multiple articles last week. Brian Kelly talking about the offense is mainly going to have two tight ends all the time, and they're going to run their 12 set, which means three tight ends on the field. That tells me that either one, uh, Nussel Myers having problems making reads, two, receivers aren't picking up the offense, running the right routes, or crisp routes are not holding on to the ball, or three, the offensive line is not doing a good a job of pass blocking, which has been the story the last three years since Brian Kelly's been there. Or, or I mean, what, what are we missing here? Or four, he's got all the confidence in the world in his run game. I think this is going to be a ground and pound LSU team. I don't think they're going to try to be fancy at all. I think they're going to be ground and pound. What do you know about this LSU offense heading into the season? I mean, Heath, they've mentioned that. I, you're going to see them. I think the identity is going to shift. They're going to have a true running game this year. It's not going to be Jaden Daniels rushing for 1,000 yards, obviously. Um, it definitely sounds like to me they almost kind of want to save Garrett Nussmeyer from himself a little bit. You're right. It, it's – we know that he can be a little bit turnover happy, careless with the football. Um, and a quarterback's best friend is a great running game. And I, I think they have, with guys like Caleb Jackson in the backfield, that great offensive line you mentioned with Will Campbell and Emory Jones, they, they've they got all the pieces of the recipe to have an elite running game in Baton Rouge. I, I think they're going to lean on that. I think they're still going to throw the football, obviously, but I think it's going to be a lot of run game, a lot of play action. Like, I think LSU is going to have some big plays some explosives in the run game against USC. I think that's going to open up the play action game, open up the downfield passing game. Um, so I think they're still going to throw the football and be balanced Heath, but I will not be surprised if it's more so leaning on that run game. And to your point, you know, from the reports I've heard in Baton Rouge, Garrett Nussmeyer, he's, he's had his days, you know what I mean? He's had his days. Where he's looked good, but he's had his days where that defense has won the day. And I, you know, it's, it's just fall camp, but you certainly don't want your quarterback out there getting dominated, getting picked off left and right, right, in fall camp. So I, I think for that reason, again, you know, I think they probably will. If if LSU can run the football virtually every play and beat you, I think they'll probably do it this year because I think that should be a strength for them. Okay. So, guys, I do want to say this. In going to the final game of this weekend, my TV will be set to this game. And I am thoroughly looking forward to A&M, Notre Dame. And I'm going to tell you right now, I think this is going to be the best game of the Labor Day weekend. Chris, give us your thoughts on the Gigam Aggies versus the struck of uh, the luck of the Irish and the Notre Dame fighting Irish. It's going to be an electric scene in College Station's thing, Ray. College game day on hand. I mean, Kyle yeah. Field's going to be rocking. Um, you know, Mike Elko's first game, taking on his old quarterback. I'm picking Notre Dame. I, I got to see it. I, I got to see it. Stingray, listen, I, I will unapologetically tell you I have to see it. I need to see proof of concept. I, I'm I'm not I'm not buying another cent of a and stock until I see something. So, it's game one. There's a lot of change. There's a lot of new. Am I concerned for Notre Dame's sake on the offensive line? I absolutely am. Starting a freshman at left tackle, starting a sophomore at guard. I think I saw they've got a combined six, six career starts on their starting offensive line. Not a recipe for success going into a hostile environment. I love Riley Leonard at the quarterback position. I think Notre Dame's defense, and I think defense is the story of this game. I think it's a lower scoring game, something like 20 to 17, but I'm going with the fighting Irish. Is it a winnable game for Texas A&M? Absolutely. But I'm siding with Notre Dame. I want A&M to go out there and prove it to me. Chris, going out the door and leaving the Stingray show, I do want to ask you, should South Carolina be on upset alert this weekend as they welcome in Old Dominion, yes or no? Stingray, no. I, I think it's – listen, okay. I, I think it's a bit of an overreaction to uh, – Old Dominion, yes, they went to a bowl game. They've done some nice things. 
South Carolina will win. It's more so about how do they look, but I don't see a world in which the Gamecocks lose the game. Okay. What well, game Chris, are you looking forward to most watching, Chris? Florida, Miami. I'm going to be there. Of course. There Florida, Miami. That's the one. So, Chris. Enjoy Gainesville, my friend. And I will tell you, no hurricanes this weekend. So that's good. I'm talking about the weather hurricanes. And so enjoy Gainesville, and we will definitely catch up with you one day next week. Stingray Heath, anytime, guys. Appreciate it. It's always a pleasure. Take care, Chris. Have fun. Eat Sonny's barbecue for us. (laughs) I got you. I'm on it. So, guys, that is all the time that we have this evening for the Stingray Show. We hope that you guys have thoroughly enjoyed the Wednesday evening edition with Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered. And when we come back tomorrow, we are going to continue to do a deep dive into week one action as we are going to be joined by a Miami reporter to get his take on Miami versus Florida. We will see you on the Thursday evening edition of the Stingray Show. We are done.